grant specialist um, at, here for the university libraries. She does amazing work um, in terms of showing you more than just where to find the money, but how to get to it and how to set up a structure on continuing to get funding opportunities. Grant Grants including anywhere from a uh, NSF type grant to a to a, um, a Fulbright, what have you. But she's going to talk to you today about structuring your portfolio, how to actually set up what it takes to even get a grant um, in general. There might be a sequel to this workshop in the future as well. So um, with that being said, I, I won't take any more of her time. Thank you so much, Beth. Join this workshop, and uh, I'll let her take over. Thank you. Okay. It's great to be here with you all. I do this all the time, um, mostly for graduate students and for PhD candidates. So this is the first time I think we're doing a workshop for undergrads, exclusively for undergrads. Some of the workshops we've done, um, hosted by the libraries and presented by the libraries, have included some undergraduates, but the majority are um, graduate uh, graduates in, in attendance. So a little bit about me. I've been here for about two and a half years um, came from the University of Arizona Libraries. Very few libraries have grants programs. We're probably one of the only ones in the country that are pursuing this in terms of training students to do this kind of work. My background, I'm I have a bachelor's degree in clarinet performance from the University of Southern California, so I'm a solo clarinetist, and uh, couldn't find employment, ended up working at a bank, ended up learning all about money, the flow of money, doing accounting on the side, performing on the side, and um, my friend resigned as the artist in residence for Pinellas County in and uh, said, oh, yes, you should go apply for that job. So I became the artist in residence for um, Pinellas County Arts Council. And uh, that was a public-private partnership. So that was government and private funds together. And then within three months, the uh, financial manager quit. And they said, oh, well, we know you do some accounting on the side. Do you want to become the financial manager for the Arts Council? And I said, I don't know anything about this nonprofit kind of management work, um, but I'll try it. So that was the beginning of my career in nonprofit management that has specialized in the area of grants, grantsmanship. Um, for five years, I was in charge of distributing funds to 37 cultural organizations in Palm Beach County. So from the arts, giving away money. Um, to arts organizations, and then working in the community foundation and um, learning how, what are the mechanics, and then serving on the National Endowment for the Arts panels and folk arts and arts and education. Um, I've served on the state panels, various state panels for culture, and um, also distributing funds for social service projects, etc. Did consulting for 10 years. So I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of people and organizations whether they were trying to get funding or whether they were trying to give away funding, distributing funds. So that's a little bit of, of my background. You're going to have a lot of information today because my goal is to make you knowledgeable enough so that we can have a conversation about grantsmanship, right? Um, by the way, this is uh, also co-sponsored, co co-presented by the IQ program. Do you know what that is? Um, it's, uh, it stands for Innovate. It's a NSF-funded program here. It stands for Innovation Through Institutional Integration. And I serve on the advisory council for that program. And um, so I like to include this kind of workshop in their series as well. So they also should get credit. So these are the things that I'm trying to do um, today. Provide you with context so that we can have an educated conversation about grantsmanship. By the end of this workshop, you will know enough to be able to have a good conversation with anyone on this topic, okay? Um, 
I'd like you to understand the processes that are involved in seeking grant funding, all of them, um, or as many as I can give you today. I'm going to show you where you can find opportunities. But what we don't want is for you to bolt right into opportunities without knowing this field of grantsmanship because you will end up in trouble. You will get in the middle of it and find yourself seeking understanding that you don't have right now. So um, rather than say, okay, here's the boat. We want you, you're gonna be going fishing. Here's the boat and have a great time, but we don't give you a fishing rod. The fish are in, in the ocean, you've got the boat, you can get there, but you don't know how to actually catch a fish because you don't have a rock. Right, so I'm going to give you the rock. Does that make sense? Um, and I want to also inspire confidence and the desire for you to actually get involved in this kind of work. So turn to your neighbor, give them a high five, and say, you're going to write grants. Okay? <laughs> so that's, that's half the battle. That's half the battle. Okay, so I want to know in this room, how many of you have been involved in grant writing at all? Other than Curtis, you have. For me, so, okay, okay. So that's good to know that everybody's kind of at the same level. The other question I want to ask or let you know is that there are cards in front of you. And um, those cards are intended, we have more, for you to note your questions as we go through this. And what I'm hoping to do, because I'm just going to do a brain dump, I'm going to go, 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 go. We're going to go through all of this material. And then I'm going to collect the cards and I'm going to quickly go through and give you the answers to those questions, if I can. And if I can't, then you'll know I can't and I'll give you the reason why I can't give you that answer. Make sense? Okay. Um, so, why are proposals um, important? Why should you be involved in this kind of work? First of all, obviously, because you can get money to do your research, or you can get money to do, to actualize an idea that you have. And I know that might not make sense, but filling out paperwork and exchanging that paperwork for funding is what what we're doing here. Um, it will empower you to own the research that you're doing, right? So that you will feel, okay, this is my project, and I'm developing this idea, and here it is on paper, in a, in a constructive way that you can communicate to someone who knows nothing about you, nothing about the project, right? From zero to complete understanding simply by reading a document. You will also prove that you have good ideas if you get funded, right? So in your resume, in your vita, it says, I was involved in these grants projects. And that says, here's a person that can unroll an idea that is creative enough to be able to come up with something that's fundable and then figure out how to communicate it to others and get funding for it. That is a huge skill, especially in this marketplace, right? Um, so, this is, these are some of the benefits of doing this work. And, and what it says here is size doesn't matter. Because it matters that strangers who don't know you are deciding to invest in your work. That is a huge benefit to your career. Regardless of how much money you got, maybe you got $500 to, do, to go travel somewhere or do something, it doesn't matter. You still put it on your Vita, right? Okay, so. This is basically the activity that you're going to be involved in, in terms of the big picture. You're going to be researching opportunities is the first step. Then planning, planning your project based on what you find in terms of a match, right? You're going to organize your data, organize your information. You're going to write the proposal. 
You're going to submit it, and then you're going to get results. The results are going to give you information that trains you in what you did incorrectly. Let's say you don't get funded the first time. Then you want the reviewer's results so that you can learn to do better, right, the next time. Um, it could be that you got funded. It would be nice to know where you were on that list, right? What were the reviewer's comments? What were the weaknesses in your proposal? You're going to have weaknesses. It's not going to be a perfect proposal, right? So you, regardless of whether you get the funding or not, you're still going to learn every time you submit. So the bottom line um, result that you're looking for is learning. Is that not correct? So you're going to create your idea, you're going to write the proposal, you're going to submit the proposal. What you want is to learn from this experience. If you get funded, great. If you don't get funded, great. Correct? <laughs> Correct? Do I hear a yes? Yes? <laughs> no. <laughs> I would like to yes. <laughs> I, I'm trying to give you this concept because it can't always be about the money. I'll give you an example. The Florida um, Museum of Natural History, there, there are these high-level researchers now writing a proposal to NSF. They know they're not going to get funded. They know they're not getting funded. Why are they doing it? So they find out why they got rejected. Right. So if they find out why they got rejected, what are they going to do with that information? They're going to submit and get funded, right? Yes. So they're, they're going through the exercise to learn to do the best job they can, even though they know the best job that they can do is not going to be enough to make it to a fundable proposal. That's how you have to think, okay? That it's okay. So when you learn to play a musical instrument, you don't learn by being perfect, right? You have to learn how to put the reed on, you have to learn how to put the clarinet together, you have to learn how to put, where to put your fingers, how slanted to have your fingers, how to put your embouchure, how to put your tongue, how to put your, where, how the breathing works to vibrate the reed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? It's the same thing. You were not born knowing how to write grants. Am I correct? Did anybody teach you that at, at your first birthday, second birthday, third? No, it's not anything that you, you learn by practicing, right? And it's okay not to get funded. Am I right? Because you did the work and you submitted and then you learned from that. Okay, these are the reasons why people don't write grants. The number one reason they don't write grants is because they're afraid of failure. And I have already given you all the reasons why, you know, that's just crazy. So, in terms of NSF proposals, the ratio of funded to not funded is 2.7, okay? So sometimes it takes more than two and a half times submitting, right? That's the average, so it's, it's, you know, it's not a perfect three times. It's about two and a half times that a researcher submits before they get funded at NSF. I can't give you the ratios for the other um, sponsors. I want to give you this information. The word funder and sponsor are interchangeable, okay? So when someone says to you a sponsor, it's the same thing as a funder. You need to know that. And I'll use that interchangeably here. So, does this make sense? The reason why people don't do this work is because they're afraid of failing. And none of you have that fear, right? 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 <laughs> oh, that was very weak. Okay. <laughs> the second reason why um, people don't write grants is because they're too complicated and overwhelming. And that's why you're here in this workshop. For the first reason is to eliminate the fear by being educated, right? And the second one is to understand the process and understand what, what you don't know about this process so that you won't feel that it's too complicated and overwhelming. There isn't a proposal that's too complicated and overwhelming, if you know what you're doing. And if a clarinet player can do this, then you can do this. Oh, you guys don't look very good. So this is the question that um, all, 
and then you want the sponsor to ask you. This is the question. Just by reading your proposal, right? That's what that's what uh, that's what you're looking for. So we're talking about a relationship, aren't we? We're talking about a relationship between a sponsoring agency and you. And it better be good. <laughs> it better be good from the very beginning until the very end. All the way through. You are not entitled to this money. Correct? You are grateful for every single conversation that you have with anyone who can help you. Yes? Yes. <laughs> exactly. And then when you get it, you're grateful. And then and, and you also know what the guidelines are for spending the funds and doing everything correctly. And if you make a mistake, you fess up and you call the program officer and say, I think I messed up. I need your help. Honesty is what keeps relationships together. Okay? So what is a grant proposal? It tells a story about an opportunity to fill a gap, to eliminate a need, to solve a problem, or research ways to do these things. Simple. That's the first thing. It presents a business plan. It says, I plan to do X, Y, Z in this time period, and this is what it's gonna cost in order to make this happen. A business plan, okay? It gives an idea of the image of the person writing the proposal. It tells me who your friends are, what work you've done with other people, why is that important? Because I'm looking at investing money in you, and I want to make sure that I'm not wasting my money. So if you've never partnered with anybody, and this is just about you, then I'm not interested in funding just you. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and I want to know, are you able to do what you say you're going to do? So this proposal is going to give me all of this information about you. And I'm only going to invest my resources, if I'm the sponsor, in those applications and those people who give me the sense that my dollars are a good investment in this project. Make sense? Okay. So what's grants management? It's all the things that you need to do to make sure that your relationship is good. And that means from the very beginning. Um, finding the right opportunity that matches up with your expertise and your skills and your needs. So if you don't have the right match, then you are trying to fit yourself, the square peg into a round hole and the person reading the proposal will know you're just interested in the money. That the work that you're going to do doesn't really match with these guidelines. And you're just in it for the money. Does that make sense? You want to make sure that what you are applying for is exactly what you want to be doing and not just writing for the sake of getting the funding and giving the reviewer what you think they want to hear that may not be true about your project simply to work it into their guidelines. You can smell a fish a mile away, all right? You can, you can tell, a reviewer can tell that this proposal is weak in terms of the not, it's not the right place for you. Um, you want to find out how much funding is given out for these awards. If you don't know what is the traditional funding amount, you might be asking for the wrong amount, right? Um, you want to know who's reviewing your proposal and what their priorities are. Because if you, if you give them priorities that don't match up, again, you're in the wrong place. Now, what is a mental movie? When you're reading a proposal, and I'm going to give you a bunch of proposals to read, so don't worry about that. You want to be able to see a mental movie of the beginning, middle, and the end. What is this project about? Why is it important? Why is it significant? Who 
prove this. Prove that no one has done this work before. Prove how your work builds on other work. But it has to be a movie. If there are giant gaps in between these, these pictures that someone has when they're reading your proposal and they can't figure it out or they're confused, forget about it. They're going to put your proposal over here with the stack that requires too much effort to understand. So you have to make sure that you're writing it for the reviewer to see the movie of what is this about. And that all the frames are there so that it makes sense. You want to learn from being declined. A declination is the same thing as being declined. And you want your relationship to be as good as at the beginning as at the end of your funded project. So that means whatever reports are required, you did them on time. Spending your money, you spent it correctly according to the guidelines. And if you needed help, you called. So those are the hallmarks of good grants management. So what is grant writing? And this is from my perspective. I, as an artist, I tend to want to be able to give my perspective rather than going and searching for what other people say about X. So in terms of grant writing, to me, it's this art and science of developing relationships with a funder or a sponsor by taking mental images, right? and converting them using words and money, symbols, right, into a cohesive document that then provides you with specific funding to do a specific task. That's all it is. It's really not complicated. Sometime in the future, you plan to do this. Now, where people get stuck is they think but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm going to be at this school. I'm not sure if I'm going to do this research. Because what if this, or what if that, and what if this other thing happens? What if I get married? What if, I, what if someone in my family gets sick? Well, these are things that happen to everyone in life, right? So they should not prevent you from making hypothetical decisions about what you wouldn't, in the best case scenario, what would you like to do? What is your idea? Yes, you're going to be accountable in some way for the idea, but life happens. And if something happens, then you negotiate. You can negotiate a no-cost extension. To it, If something happened and you needed to take care of some family issues, probably you can ask for a no-cost extension. There are situations that happen in everyone's life, but you must be able to project today, January 20th, my choice of what I want to do next year is this, and it's on paper, and, I, and this is what I believe today. I honestly believe this. So you have to get past this idea that what if I can't do what I'm saying that I'm proposing to do? Every single grant writer in this country projects out maybe at least nine months to three years to five years ahead to describe their project to total strangers who are volunteering their time to review your ideas. Everybody knows that this isn't, you know, that, that stuff happens. So you have to be able to project, I plan to do X. And that's the biggest hurdle that I've had with novice grant writers, is that they're afraid to commit to a plan, or afraid to create a plan in case there are things that happen that prevent it. Am I hitting on a nerve here? No? Yes? That's one of the biggest fears that people have when it comes to writing proposals. So, you must know your sponsor. Did I skip the screen? No, I didn't. There are three different kinds of sponsors. Public sponsors mean the money that are that is distributed by public sponsors is tax money. Okay, it's public, it's government. Public equals government dollars. Okay, private money comes from foundations. 
That's private money. It's completely different from government money. Corporation money is a kind of money that comes from corporations. It's private. It's not government. So basically the two categories that you want to really um, distinguish is whether this is public money or private money. And we'll go through the differences between them. Now, I've written lists of, of general statements. Of okay, the other important thing that you should know is that grantsmanship and grant writing is gray. Okay? Gray meaning there's no right wrong. There's no black white. It's gray. It's that's why in a way it's an art form. Because every single opportunity is different from the other opportunity. Every single deadline and guideline is different from the other one. You you need to know that you need to be flexible. And oh, I learned from XYZ instructor that in order to get this money I have to do I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this, and I want to follow these rules. And then you go to someone else who is giving you mentorship on this project, on developing your proposal, and they tell you the complete opposite based on their experiences. I'll give you a story. Do you know DSR is the uh, Division of Sponsored Research here on campus? There is a, a, a staff member there. Her name is Linda Isaacs. Write that down, Linda Isaacs. She is available to help you submit your fellowship application. She's an expert in submitting fellowship applications. Okay? She told me the story. She said that there were several students that came in um, for help. And one student insisted that the information that she was giving them was wrong. That they had heard from someone else that the way to do this application was this way. And they were pushing her with their knowledge. Instead of listening to this other opinion by this expert, who that's pretty much all she does, is help people submit their proposals. So you always want to be like a reed. You want to be flexible. You don't want to be like a tree in a hurricane. You want to be like a reed. Okay, I'm getting this information now. I'm getting this information now. Let me formulate this gray area that I've got here. And I'm going to do the best I can to follow the best advice that I can, but I'm not going to be rigid, okay? I'm not going to say, well, I heard this from my buddy, and that must be the correct way to do it. So let's go through these public sponsors. Um, what are the characteristics of public sponsors? It's a government money, so it's run by government agencies, and usually these are larger awards then I'm saying usually. But the Ford Foundation gives out large awards and that's private. So do you see that, again, we're talking gray area. In general, government money is bigger. It's usually more reliable and you can come back multiple times to get it. I'm giving you generalizations. Um, they don't like to change programs too much because that's too much effort. They like to set up a program and run it for many, many, many years. You'll see when we go to the NSF site for fellowships that the guidelines were set up in 2007, the deadlines were set up in 2007, and then in the future they're saying the dates are the same for 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, just use the same date to submit. So, Usually when they establish a program, it doesn't go away, it doesn't change too much. They have larger staffs, right? So they can handle questions. They can handle personal conversations, emails, give you advice, right? Um, sometimes there's public meetings and there's trainings that are available that you want to go to, especially if an NSF representative comes here, um, National Science Foundation, or if a Ford Foundation representative comes, or a MacArthur Foundation representative comes, you want to be in the room, regardless. But, um, but you will most frequently have opportunities to meet with public officials who have public money. The private foundations don't tend to do that so much. Um, you're, you're, you are accountable to public officials, 
to make sure that whatever you say happens with your proposal, um, the process is more time consuming on the government side than it is on the private side. So usually, you know, the application is much thicker, requires much more information than on the private side. Um, they don't usually like to take big risks, right? Because it's the government. Um, and um, there are usually restrictions on funds, especially food. Um, usually food related to events, related to whatever. Um, travel and food that go together are usually okay, but in general, government funds have more restrictions than, um, than private funds. So, given that, but there are circumstances that then refute every single thing that I said here. This is just the general knowledge about public funders. Private, private sponsors, usually the awards are smaller. Usually they have smaller staffs. So, because they don't want to spend a lot of the funding on staff, they want to spend their money on awards, right? So, families that set up these private foundations or corporations that set up these pri private foundations or whatever group that sets up these private foundations, they, their goal is to give out the most money possible, which means they're going to scrimp on their own operations and management. So there's gonna be less help for individuals to get um, assistance and, and management of those, um, of those um, opportunities. Usually the timetables can change all of a sudden now the deadline is what? <laughs> you know, they move the timeline whenever they want. There's less rigidity in general. There's more flexibility. Um, most of the policies are guided towards the local community, but then you have these national ones that aren't. Um, more likely to invest in a new or innovative idea, a really out there idea, like the MacArthur Genius Grants. Those are, those are grants that are given in, in secret. I don't know if you know about those, but um, there are secret MacArthur Foundation nominees all over the country, and they find special people that are doing really innovative things, changing people's lives in big ways, through science, through arts, through education, and these folks get nominated for these, I think it's a $500,000 award. And then one day they get a phone call from the MacArthur Foundation that says you've just been awarded a genius award, and it changed their changes their whole life. I think it's five hundred thousand. Yeah, it's a, it's a half million. Okay. And it's generally it's generally a friend, a f actual friend of mine got one. Really. And it was it was at the University of Georgia, and she won a half million dollar grant, and it and it's basically just a grant that they give you. And there's you no are, there's no there's no um, stipulation on what you do with it is but it's supposed to just further whatever you are doing. You can you can actually send your kids to college on that money. Mm -hmm. You can do whatever you want with that money. So see, in, in the in the private world, it's whatever goes. Okay, everyone every foundation behaves differently. So those are some uh, concepts about and descriptions about private sponsors. And then you have corporate sponsors. And um, they usually want something in return. So if you're going to use their name or you're going to request funding to do X, most of these corporations don't give out fellowship awards. They do give out scholarships sometimes. But they want other people to know their brand name, that you're connected to that entity that whatever event you're doing is sponsored by them. So they want an exchange. It's not an altruistic relationship. If they're gonna give you money for your project, they wanna see their name all over it, all right? So those are the general differences between these three categories. So what's it, what is important about this is that you need to know who the sponsoring agency is, which means reading and studying and learning what's online about them as much as you can. Because they're really your customer. Is that not correct? The sponsoring agency is your customer. 
And if you understand that concept, then your interactions and behavior and the work that you do is going to match up with what they're looking for. Okay, so these are some of the things that you might need to know about your sponsor. Who have they funded previously? For instance, for a fellowship, do you want to know how many people at UF are getting these awards? Do you know that you could find out for NIH fellowships? Who got NIH fellowships on campus? If you did the work, you could find out. Um, you could find out how much money they got. If you are interested in finding out who got Ford Foundation um, fellowships, you could find that out too. Wouldn't that be interesting to know? What, how did UF do in awards from these entities? How many NSF awards did we get last year for graduate research fellowships? We got 20. Is there a list? Yes. Where is it located? On the site at NSF. You can go and find this information out. That would give you a lot of information. How much did they get funded? Um, what was the focus? What kind of language does the sponsor use? You want to be able to understand their language and be able to write in a way that they can understand. Right? Um, are you ready to answer the questions that they've asked? Who makes the decisions about the funding? Are they volunteers? Is there a program officer that, that, um, that gives you funded, funding for the project without going to a group, a panel discussion? So you want to know what the process is of how awards are given out. Because that then gives you information about how to write your proposal on the front end. So a program officer is someone who directs the funding, manages the funding for that specific opportunity. So when you call NSF, NIH, you want to talk to the program officer in charge of this program. That's a technical term. Program officer is a technical term for the type of people who manage these opportunities. Okay, you want to know the history of funding um, and how does the funder like to be treated? Do they want, you know, when you have an issue, should you call them, should you email them? Would they prefer that you always email them? The first thing that you say to any sponsor when you have someone on the phone that you're speaking to is, is this a good time? Hi, I'm Besta Carver. Is this a good time to talk to you about my project? They will likely say, no. Could you call at this other time? Or when would it be more convenient? Because they've got a stack of proposals that they're working through, or they're working through a special problem. So that's really important to know. You also need to know yourself, right? You need to know what your assets are. What do you bring to the table? That's your history. That's your connections. That's all the work that you've done in your specific research area. That's the people that you know, the mentors that you've worked with. Do you know? The, right now, the professors that you've had since you've been here, what their research areas are, what funding they've received, who they've received funding from. Raise your hand if you know that information. <laughs> All right. Is, is, is your professor your asset? An asset? Yes. Wouldn't it be important to know if they were a reviewer on any panels? Right? Would it be important to know whether your professor traditionally reads proposals written by um, student applicants? It would. Be. All of these are assets. These are things that you don't know about people in your own environment. How are you going to then translate not knowing about the people in your own environment to not knowing about a sponsor? Right? So first you have to know yourself. I will tell you that every time I do a, a presentation and I say, okay, everyone in the room, raise your hand if you know what you need. Raise your hand if you know what you don't have. Everybody raises their hand. They can tell me exactly what they don't have. Right? So raise your hand if you, don't, if you know what you don't have, what you need. Am I correct? 
you need money, you need this, you need that, you, right? When I ask, if you, can you raise your hand and tell me what you have? What you have access to. Do you know what you have access to? I will tell you that you don't. And that's why you're disadvantaged. Everyone in the world who doesn't know their environment and know who they are in touch with and what they know and who they know, right, is disadvantaged. And that's the opportunity to learn. So I consider myself disadvantaged. I'm a clarinetist. I'm constantly looking for information about other people and what they know how to do. Because one day, I'm going to need to ask them for help. Right? So you've got professors. You have colleagues, right? You have friends. You know whether those friends of yours have ever written a proposal, ever sat on a review committee, ever read any proposals, know anything about grant writing. Have you ever had a conversation about grant writing with your friends? Probably not. Oh, yes. I got a, I got a, I got a hand. Okay, so you need to know if anybody knows anything about this stuff. Because then that's going to be your support group, right? One, thing, I, one thing I'd like to mention to the group, before you guys graduate, before you guys graduate, you should make sure you know that she's, from, from the people you're working with right now, from the people you're working with, you got four months to find out if they sit on any committees, if they've written any. If they've been on, if they worked to, for, for NSF or NIH, those are, and I tell you, it'll, it'll intrigue your professors for you to ask that question, because grad students barely ask that question, let alone undergrad. Yeah, exactly. So we found, I put out a, um, a, a workshop notice that we were going to run a workshop on NSF um, doctoral dissertation improvement grants, and. A professor wrote me back and said, hey, I'm the director of the program for NSO for linguistics. I'd be happy to run a workshop for you in the future at another time. So that's how I learned that the way NSF works is that they hire professors from academic institutions to run and be program officers and program directors within their system. For three years, he lived in Washington, D.C., and commuted back to Gainesville, but he was also, he kept his faculty position. I didn't know that. That was a big deal. Then I had the director of the program for linguistics funding giving a talk here on how to write grants for his program. Not bad, huh? And I have that, we have that video. So it's now accessible to everyone. So you have to know what you've got, and I can guarantee you, you don't. And you should go back and look at how many, how many professors have you had since you've been here? A lot. Okay. Know yourself part two, right, is your liabilities. Know what you are lacking. Because you can't fill the gap. And, and also you want to stay away from speaking negatively about your assets or speaking negatively. You can always find a positive way of spinning what it is that you lack. Because that's why you're writing the proposal. Is that not correct? So you're seeking funding to travel. You're seeking funding to, uh, to change people's lives, to learn something new, to create something different. You need to know what you're missing and how you're going to get it. How are you going to get this mentoring that you're going to need? How are you going to get, um, how are you going to um, broadcast the results of your work? All right? Okay. So now you're ready to figure out, I'm just trying to look at the time, um, how to determine whether you're ready or not to do this work. And these are the questions that you would ask yourself. What's the deadline? Can I meet the deadline? Right? The first thing you want to know about an opportunity is what the deadline is. You need about two to three months okay, to do this work. So if the deadline is in two weeks, you want to wait until next year. right? Okay. The grant period. This is a technical word. 
The grant period is when the money starts and the money ends. Okay? So that's a technical word. You should know the, the, the term grant period. It's when the money starts and when the money ends. And you and they will tell you what this is. And you want your work to occur during the grant period, from the beginning to the end. Okay. Do you have enough information to do the to do the project? Is it worth your time to do the project? And I would say yes. In all of your cases, if you're a student and there's $500 or $100 available on the table and you think you can get it, you should write it. Simply because it's a reward that you can put on your resume um, and, and someone invested in you. Can you stay on mission? What, th what this means is, is the, the tail wagging the dog or is the dog wagging the tail? Right? You want your project to fit into the guidelines and not try to force it to fit. Okay, this is how you organize your process. The first thing is that you're going to do once you find a match for yourself. Let's say it's an NSF um, fellowship proposal. You're going to read the guidelines. And then from those guidelines, you're going to develop your own checklist. Why? Because most of the checklists that they give you are not going to be adequate for your needs. I'm going to show you some checklists that we've developed that you can use. But what I've done is embed in the checklist the criteria for evaluation. Most checklists do not include criteria for evaluation. If you have all of that merged into one list, okay, they're going to evaluate me on, on X. So X, I'm going to write about that here. But if you look at the guidelines and you don't have embedded criteria, then you will be evaluated, but you won't have touched on those areas that they're seeking information. Okay? You're going to create a list of all the activities that need to happen to make this project happen. And then you're going to take that and say, okay, how much is it going to cost me to make sure I can get all of this work done. That's how you create your budget. And then, once you have your timeline and you have your budget, you say to yourself, is this feasible? Is this a good idea? Does this make sense? And if it makes sense at that point, then you start answering the narrative questions. So this is my secret to the success that I've had in teaching people to write proposals is you have your own checklist with embedded criteria, and um, you create your activity list, your timeline, and then your budget. You do not write the proposal in the order in which they want it. You write it in this order to be successful. The other problem that most people have is comes when you're relying on other people to give you stuff letters of support, letters of commitment. Let's say you want to do research in Africa for a Fulbright scholarship, and you don't have a facility. But you find a facility, and you need a letter from this facility manager, this lab, that says they will agree to let you use their facility. So you want to ask for this letter two months in advance, right? because it might take you that long to get it. But if you do it in the order in which they want this packaged, the letters of support is at the end. So let's say you start writing the narrative at the beginning, then you do your budget, then you do your timeline, and the last thing you do is get your letters of support. Forget about it. You are dead in the water. You're not gonna get those letters in time. So you wanna change the order in which you do the process of creating these proposals so that you can be in control of when you get what you need. Does that make sense? Okay. If you need, um, if you need to submit through the division of sponsored research, because each proposal is different, sometimes you can submit by yourself. You don't need approval, but sometimes you need to go through the university's approval process. So. Again, you need to verify, it could be with Linda Isaacs or anyone at the Division of Sponsored Research, 
do I need to go through DSR to get approval? If not, then you're, you're on your own with your mentor or who, whomever is helping you. I'm going to skip this slide, which is um, nightmare stories about people um, who've written the whole thing and then didn't have their letters of support, or um, have done boilerplate proposals, sent out the same proposal to all these people, and didn't get any funding. Um, I've heard from other professors that uh, that they use this shotgun approach, write the same, write an idea, just throw it out there. I don't do that. My rate of successful proposals in, term, in comparison to my declinations is really high. I'm at an 80 to, to 90% approval awards. Why? Because I don't do anything unless I know that it's feasible. I do the timeline and I do the budget and then I decide, do we go or do we stop? Most people just go, 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 go. And it's about numbers. Numbers of proposals out there. To me, it's not about numbers, numbers of proposals. It's about the quality of your work in preparation for the deadline. And whether or not this is a feasible project. So these are typically the, the basic things that most proposals ask for scientific merit, or if it's not science and your humanities, what's the significance of the work that you're going to be doing? Why is this important, correct? Broader impacts has to do with who else is going to benefit from the work that you're doing? How are other people going to know about the work that you're doing? What's your dissemination plan for getting the information and results that you learn, that you achieve through your project out there to the general public or to students. How are you going to make an impact on others by the work that you're doing? Okay, what, how are you going to evaluate the, the quality of the results of the work that you do? What are, you, what are you planning to do and when are you planning to do it? Right? And who, who do you need in order to make this happen? Who did you get to make this happen? Right? Who, who's committing to working with you? This, these usually nothing in life and nothing in grantsmanship is a solo activity, right? So even preparing the proposal is not a solo activity. So this is really important. Partnerships, other people that agree that this is important and they're putting themselves behind you and they're going to join you in your effort to do X. Okay, so you want to make the job easy for the reviewer. Put yourself in their shoes. You have now volunteered to be an NSF reviewer. They contact you, they say, will you serve on this grant panel? And you say, yes. Now one day, you get, in the old days, you would get a box delivered by UPS, it would, and, and they would put it on your front doorstep, and you would come home from work and say, oh my goodness, I gotta read how many of these? Um, now, more often than not, the panels show up in D.C., in Washington, D.C., in a room with no windows, and you've got all these people, you've got three people on each proposal, they're, they're reading everything electronically, so they're reading it on screens, they're probably not using paper, which is really hard to do. And then they're sitting down among themselves, the three people, and having a discussion and they're doing this on their own time. They are volunteering to sit there. So if you're not making it easy for them to look at the criteria, so they've got to judge you based on this criteria. If you don't map your words to the criteria, then they have to work harder to figure out what score to give you. Right? You want to make it easy for them. So you want to follow exactly the order of the sections that they give you in the guidelines. You want your fonts to be easy to read, but when, it, and, and in some cases, you change the font so that they will read this specifically. But that's not for all proposals. So again, this list of how to make it easy for the reviewers, 
is great. It may work in some instances and it may not work in other instances. Um, you want to have your goals stated, regardless of any application that you make. You have to have that um, and address the criteria. So you want to make it easy for anyone who's reviewing your proposal. Now, I don't know if we have time to go through this, but this is an example proposal. Um, this was funded, and we have the entire proposal for you. And we also have the reviewer's comments about this proposal. Um, Doug Levy, Dr. Doug Levy, who's an ornithologist, is the person that, um, that worked with this grad student to get this award. So this is actual text that comes directly from her proposal. Well, it's a guy, really, from his proposal. So you have the title. Just looking at the title creates a hook. So there's something different. Testing an ecological cost of habitat corridors and with relationship to the spread of invasive species. Okay? The hook is cost. That's innovative. So he's pointing this out to you. The first paragraph gives you the issue, or the first sentence is the issue that this applicant is trying to resolve. Right away, the first moment, you have an understanding of what the problem is, right? I'm going to go to the next slide, okay? Because we have the whole proposal for you, and I'll show you where that is. The second sentence is the solution. First sentence is the problem, second sentence is the solution. It has to be simple, right? We're going to keep going. When you get further down, there's the controversy. Well, this is, this is what makes the problem more complicated, okay? So now you know what's controversial. Now, as you get down, you finally get the statement of purpose. I will test the effectiveness of corridors in restoring communities of native ants in a highly threatened ecosystem, longleaf pine savanna. Talk about, okay, do you have a picture of what this guy's going to do? Right? It's one paragraph. Right? You've got everything you need to create your mental movie. Now, the next section has to do with your hypothesis. This student says that he has four things, four hypotheses that he's testing. One, two, three, four. It's not labeled, but it's in italics. Right? Going on, same, same text. The method, the experimental manipulation required for H1 through 3 has already occurred. So what has happened previously, now the reviewer knows, oh, okay, I'm with you. And then how he's going to analyze the hypothesis is, is it's a simple before, after control impact design. Another part, so a few words that give you a big picture, right? A big movie with very few words. So he must have written this big essay and then cut it back, cut it back, edited, edited, edited to get to the core information necessary for the mental movie. Make sense? Okay. Now, broader impacts, we talked about that. So the first one is integration of theory and practice. To integrate straightforward tests of corridor theory with restoration. The second impact, how this study fills a need in conservation. How is this work changing people's lives, right? Broader impacts, same thing. Novel twist, what we call a hook. So in grantsmanship language, you try to hook the reader one way, and then you try to hook them another way. Anything innovative is a hook. 
to get the reader to continue reading. So there's, there's something innovative. But restoring native biodiversity may not be as simple as removing non-native species. Then there's a personal statement. I believe ecologists have a responsibility to educate the general, per, uh, the general public about their work. Okay, that's, that's his belief. And, and he has a specific plan in order to do that. So first he states his philosophy, and then he states how he's going to do it. Okay, so the general advice that we would give is to start small, but to do something, right? Do something could be find out what your professor's research area is and what panels they've served on in the past and what you could learn from them in terms of grant writing. That, that, that doing this work is a skill and requires practice. It is not a gift that you are born with. Please let me be clear. It is not a gift that you are born with. It's like a musician. You know, you can have all kinds of gifts, but if you never practice, forget about it. Um, get mentoring. Follow the directions in the guidelines. Know the guidelines. Um, know what the funding agency, what the sponsor wants to fund. And don't pretend, okay, if, you, if, you, if, if you're not a good match, then don't go there. Put yourself in the shoes of the reviewer. So what do we have for you? We have these really um, wonderful links of information. And I'm going to take you there, but I want, I want to show you how to get there. So the library's homepage. How many of you know how to get to the libraries? Does this look familiar? I hope. <laughs> this should look familiar. OK. When you're at this page, the second link on the left is using the libraries, OK? You're going to remember this, right? OK. Then you go to Great Resources. This is my page. And um, we have Suchitra Yelapantula, who's a um, graduate student in computer engineering. And she's my, teaching, uh, my um, graduate assistant. And she maintains the page for me and does the videos. And is just my right hand. I'm really happy with her. Um, you go to this site, and this gives you lots and lots of information. Okay. The first thing that you can do is you can go here on the left to Fellowship Grants for Students and Scholars. And you, you click here, and what do you get? You get this master list of table of contents, and it's divided up into wherever you are in your career. Okay. So if you're interested in funding for undergraduates, if you're interested, this is what we have just now in here. But there are other sources. <coughs> funding for graduate study, postdoc, and for faculty fellowships, right? Here you have the deadline, you have the link. If you go here, it takes you to the explanation. So it's an annotated um, information. These are all, this is all the basic information that you need. You go here, and then here you have the link to get to this opportunity. Now, remember I told you that NSF is a government agency, and it's an established program. In 2007, they established the deadlines, and they haven't changed them since. Okay? So is this confusing to you when you see deadline, January 15, 2007? Yes. What do you mean? I missed it. <laughs> Not. You are now an educated consumer. Am I correct? You now know that it's January 15, 2011. Right? For that category. And look at all these other categories. Okay? So. That's one resource that we have for you. We are not going to be able to go through each of these deadlines to go through what it is that you have to do to be able to meet the deadline. We cannot physically do that here. But there is a way for you to get lots of information. So this is a pretty good table. If, if you're interested in international, undergraduate, graduate, etc., 
you can go here. Um, we did a lot of research on international funding. Okay, so that's one place to find opportunities. The other place you can do is, uh, the, we have a funding alert that comes out that Sushi prepares. You can subscribe to this funding alert by sending an email um, to me and um, we will put you on the list. Or there's, there's a place here that says, right, Sushi? Maybe on this funding alert here. When you click on the funding alert, here's Sushi's address right here. You send an email that's uh, to this address, and uh, we'll put you on the alert. So here's an alert. We're the only ones that are doing these kind of alerts with new um, awards for individuals. DSR puts out a newsletter, but it's not for individual funding. This is for individual funding. Um, DSR's uh, newsletters are for institutional funding. Okay, so if you go to Funding for Individuals, which is at the end, where does it start? Here we go. Collaborative Research Fellowships. It tells you the award for how long, for how many years, and how many awards are given. And then the link. So this gives you a lot of information about what's available. You could say to yourself, you know, I'm going to spend an hour a week on reading this information. I'm going to spend two hours a week on going through these opportunities and reading to see if what I'm interested in is actually one of these opportunities. The other thing you could do is go to our workshop page, which is here on the left. So let's say you're interested in NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program, and you want to see the checklist. Here's an example of the checklist that I created for this opportunity. Here's the guidelines, right? Here's the website. These are all the deadlines for each of the disciplines. Is anybody matched up here with any of these? Yes? Okay. I put letters of reference way up top because I want you to pay attention to the letters that you need to get. Questions. If you have questions, you can ask here. You can find out more about the solicitation um, information, about the guidelines, etc., what they're looking for. Registration in fast lane. NSF uses a specific method for getting proposals electronically and it's called fast lane. You also might hear the word grants.gov. Some applications go through a system called grants.gov. It's just a system. It shouldn't scare you, okay? Fastlane is a system for submitting your proposals. That's all it is. Now, I've given you the information for where to send your transcripts, um, the letters of support, et cetera, and here are the essays that you need to write. And it says 12-point type, Times New Roman, one inch margins, eight and a half by 11 paper, right? So you write your personal statement, two pages, single spaced, okay? Previous research experience, two pages, single spaced. Proposed plan of research, two pages. Are you kidding me? It's six pages and I get $90,000? That's the award. You get $90,000 over a three-year period for six pages of work. Now tell me that you're not going to do that work. That's absolutely, you know. So you have, to, in, you have to address intellectual merit because here's the criteria. Remember I told you the key to success is mapping your narrative to the criteria. Broader impacts. Answer these questions. How well does the activity advance discovery and understanding while promoting teaching, training, and learning? How can you prove that what you're saying does that? Because that's how the judge, the panel, is judging you. Okay, so that's the end of the checklist. You can write your own checklist for any opportunity, correct? It's just a list of questions. It's just a list of the criteria questions. 
and everything that you need to put in, in within the context. So on my workshop page, our workshop page, the library's workshop page, you will find a series of these workshops and the date that it was given. You will find mostly that there's a video. So you can actually sit and watch the training, correct? These are the presenters, these are the slides that the presenters um, presented, and here's an awarded application. You click here, and you go to the institutional repository, and how do I make this into, oh, next. There's, there's the proposal. Okay, here's your personal statement. Two pages with reference. Previous research experience. Two pages, reference. The role and then the final page, I can't remember what the impact or the previous research. I couldn't remember, I, I don't remember what the question was. So here, and then here are her references. Here's her rating sheets. This is what the reviewer said about her proposal. Okay, isn't that cool? Um, so we want you to be using the workshop page site on here. Um, and I'm actually going to give you an assignment. Am I done with the, did I go through all the, Oh, I didn't go through the last okay. homework one. Yes. So, what we'd like you to do for homework is to go through here and pick two opportunities. So, these are the um, NSF one, NSF workshops. Um, you're not going to do these, but here, other workshops. Here's Fulbright. We have the video for Fulbright. Um, if you're interested in museum studies, anybody interested in museum studies? Okay, we have two videos for two different classes that I did on specifically museum studies, grant writing for museum studies. Um, we have actually two uh, Fulbright videos. We're going to have this video up, so you'll be able to come back to this and watch that again if you see if, if you're interested in that. Um, which were the other ones that we have an NIH video about the process of evaluating proposals so that you can see what that's like. It's actually a video in the room while the reviewers are reviewing. Very interesting. Um, so there are enough videos here that we would like you to pick two, watch those videos, and then write a list of questions that you have related to what you just saw. And that will be, and then you'll turn those questions in to Curtis. He will send them to me. We will collate them. And the next training will be answers to the questions that you have um, provided to us. So it will be customized to what you're interested in hearing more about. And if that doesn't work, and this is the last workshop, then that would be fine. I would wish you all the best. But I think that it would be smart if, if we try to do this. You're not in a class. You're not mandated to do this. It's just my suggestion for learning um, and, and moving forward. We wanted to show you that under our, let's see, under the McNair, so we have Julian's full proposal. Remember we went through and dissected that proposal? We have the full proposal now. He just sent it today at 5 o'clock. Here's his personal statement. Look how nice this is with the, with the bold and the underline so that you know what you're reading. You probably remember it. We have his whole proposal. We have his rating sheets. So 
you have demonstrated that you can articulate a reasonable research project to test some theoretical questions, the answers to which would advance the field. Your background of education and experience bodes well for success. I applaud your use of a pre-existing system. I do question why ants. Are they ideal for the test? It's just really interesting to see how reviewers think. If you want to read more proposals, we can take you to this link here on the left that says past awards. You click here and it's broken. Um, how did we get there? We got there a different way. I'll show you. I can get there. I'm going to try a different way. I'm going to go to the home page. Sorry. I'm going to go to the library's home page. We're going to click on libraries and collections. We're going to go to UF Digital Collections includes IR at UF. IR is Institutional Repository. An institutional repository is like a digital library for all of UF stuff. I'm going to go here. These are all of our digital libraries. We have 6 million pages in our digital libraries at UF. We're one of the largest digital libraries in the country. Down at the bottom you see institutional repository. You click here. Here you see grant proposals. You click here. And we have all of these grant proposals that you can read if you wanted to learn how to write grants. They're mostly library proposals. But here we have loaded for you NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program, um, another one, and another one. Actually, we have three. Okay. Um, and we're hoping that the reviewer sheets are there. We have Fulbright grant proposals. If you're interested in doing um, research in foreign countries, you will see two examples of winning, winning proposals right here. So in total, since I've been working here and actually the last year trying to get proposals to us so that we can share them, we have five proposals that we can share with you. I would highly recommend that you read them. The best way to learn to write proposals is to read other people's winning proposals. Not to copy from them, obviously. Not to plagiarize, but to see what's the formula, what's the recipe for being successful. And if you find yourself reading it, strong mental movie, right? And you keep getting hooked. Ooh, I want to read more about this. Ooh, I, now he's really getting my interest then you see why another reviewer who would read this would get hooked into funding. Does that make sense? And it's all truthful information. Truthful on the day that they wrote the proposal. Right? Okay, does anybody have questions? My contact info. Is my contact info here on, the, on our um, picture? On our, yeah, on, the whole, on our site, though. Yes. So here, go here to funding. Suchi, how do I get to, isn't it funding? It You're is. You're in US. You have a lobby. Oh, I'm in New York. for doing research, uh, community of science, we've got a ton of stuff, and the links that we provide you on here also give you more resources for finding opportunities. Any questions? Have I totally, did I do what I said I was going to do?
Do you feel like you could confidently have a conversation with someone about grants? Yes. And you would be com you would be confident. So, do you feel like you could create a checklist and and actually submit a proposal? Yes. There should be no reason, I, especially after you go to a couple of the workshops, watch the videos. They're only one hour. Okay. We don't do workshops like this. I don't usually do an hour and a half. All the other workshops are only one hour. So you can do that. You can look at the checklist. If there's a checklist posted, print those out. Look at how that was created. Go to the website. See what the, what, what the solicitation is. What are the guidelines? And you'll see that it can discourage you. It can confuse you if you choose to be discouraged and confused. But you can choose to be organized and say, I can translate all of this garbledy gook stuff that doesn't make any sense into a checklist that makes lots of sense to me. And I will use my materials rather than the materials that are given at the website. Right? You're going to translate it so that you can do it. All of you had to apply to get into the McNair Scholars Program, didn't you? Or was this a gift? It was a gift. Mr. Bird did. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, you've already successfully been awarded through paper, right? Or through an electronic means of communicating about yourself, right? So you should have no problems translating that positive experience to the next level, which is to write a proposal to another sponsor. And if you need help, you know that you can ask. You can ask multiple people. So, uh, closing comments. Does anybody have any closing comments? I have a question. Yes. How do you feel about preliminary um, measurements? So support good science as a researcher or for a new grant writer to be on Absolutely critical. Other questions? I have a quick question. The, can you give any examples? Now, you, we, we have a good idea of public, um, public grants in terms of NSF or NIH, but can you give a few examples just to the group about give some specific examples of public, private, and corporate? So the Pepsi Challenge? Do you know corporate. about that? That's yeah. corporate. Um, what are they getting out of that? A lot of publicity. Um, feel good, drink more Pepsi. Um, Neiman Fellowships, Neiman is a private, it's private. Um, we could go through here. Uh, I'm not sure if this one is, Sushi, but it might be this computer science might be private. Kennedy Research Grants, I'm not sure. That's private. Private? Yes. Yeah, the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. What about Ford? Ford is private. It's private. Yeah. It's not a corporate, you know, it's not no longer tied to the corporation. It's the, it's, it, the Ford family set it up and it's a private foundation. Um, yeah. How do military um, grants funding differ from regular uh, government funding? If you are a military personnel, I have no information. Not as, not as military personnel, but I mean, like, my research group, we get a lot of funding from DOD, Department of Defense, it's, Air Force. It's public funding. It's public, yeah. It's government funding. Yeah, there's no specific. They have their own, each yeah. one of them is okay. going to be, yeah, a, another, it's 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 very specific gray area. You got to go learn about that. <laughs> yes. Other questions? Those are great questions. Um, I have another question, um, and this is for the group because these are very ambitious students. And 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 say for instance, I know there are sometimes conflicts in sponsorship, meaning you can't apply to more than one in a particular area. Can you speak to that all yes. at all so in terms of because some there might be you know you see, you'll see like two or three grants that are very similar 
within the same plays? I would recommend applying to all of them. Oh, okay. And making sure that your, your proposal fits with that guideline. And don't be lazy and submit the same thing to all three. But then, if you get one, you must disclose to the others that you've been awarded. Right? And then sometimes you negotiate first for some other piece, but you don't double dip. You don't get funding for the same expense from two different sponsors or from three different sponsors. Okay? It must be a unique expense that only one party is paying for. And, and you have to be upfront and honest. You know, right away when you're notified of one of those awards, you, you must disclose it to the other sponsoring agency for which you are wait pending application. Now, you said something just before, just when you started. <coughs> Why shouldn't I send the same proposal? Because every guideline is different. And every opportunity is different. And you're being judged in a different manner for each one. So you cannot assume Never assume in grant writing. Never assume. Always check it out. We just found out that in the past, this one agency where we were applying to would block out um, uh, the area of the budget for salaries and fringe, for, full, for, for salary and fringe for employees. And they don't do that anymore. And I was like, oh, this means that we can ask for funding for salaries and fringe but it's not explicit in the proposal guidelines that now you can do that. All it did was in the formatting of the budget, instead of blacking out that area, it's now you're able to populate that with some figures. So I wrote an email. So I'm just confirming that it now is okay to ask for funding for salaries and fringe for permanent employees during the grant period. And the answer was yes. Okay, so I know enough about that application to ask that question, but other people might not. So the more you know, the more, if you go through and watch all those workshops, you will be one educated person. I'll tell you that. Um, I'm not the presenter on all the workshops. We have multiple presenters. We have students who've been awarded who are presenters in the workshops. We have um, uh, panelists who are here at UF, who've been on other panels, who are presenters. And we have the one who's the program officer for NSF, who presented for DDIG, um, social and behavioral and economic applications for um, doctoral dissertation improvement grant. So this is the work that we've done in the past year and a half. Well, less than a year and a half. It's November of 2009 when we started. We're hoping to have the best grants resource um, page in the country, and I think we do already. Um, well, I want to thank you for being here at the Marston Library. Don't forget the libraries and IQ presented this for you today. And um, I wish you all the best. And we, I would like to have a, an email group. Um, we'll create an email group for you. So if I find um, opportunities or information that I think you should have, if you sign this, um, we'll make an email group for you, okay? So make sure you sign up. There's sheets all over. And I guess that's it.